Okay, want to uh, welcome Digby. Oh, nice. Let's bring her in. Heather, can you hear it? I can. There we go, ladies and gentlemen. Heather Parton uh, or Digby from the blog Hullabaloo. Of course, people can also read your stuff at salon.com. Uh, here with Emma. Happy New Year, Heather. Happy New Year to you, too. I hope you guys are doing well. Your sh show's been excellent since you got back. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Very nice to say. Hope you're uh, well, too. Um, I have better manners than Sam. So. Yes, I hope you're well, too. Uh, it goes unspoken, yes. <laughs> So uh, a lot of stuff went on yesterday. Usually we look back on the week, but it feels like it was all sort of like backloaded this week yeah. into uh, Thursday. Um, I was just talking about the um, I was just talking about the Supreme Court and um, and uh, the the vaccine mandates. I mean, aside from just the the sheer insanity of it, um, it is also. You know, and I guess like they did not explicitly attack the legitimacy of an agency being delegated this authority from Congress, but they do. They are taking a step, right? They are taking a step in that Congress would have had to have said in the affirmative, despite the absence of any type of, you know, limiting look, uh, Congress gave OSHA authority and they made a determination. We're going to either limit it or not limit it to threats that could exist outside of the workplace. I mean, this is so insane that, um, and and so uh, uh, just your thoughts. <laughs> well, yeah, I actually wrote about this for Salon uh, this morning. It just, just went up a few minutes ago. Um, you know, obviously you're, you're absolutely right. It's insane. It makes no sense whatsoever that, you know, they said, well, this isn't really a workplace issue because you can get COVID someplace else. I mean, the fact that you're in a room for eight hours a day with a bunch of other people breathing all over the place, um, you know, I guess that doesn't count as being a specific workplace danger. I mean, they think that asbestos is a specific, they have rules that say that, that employers are not allowed to expose their their employees to asbestos, but apparently COVID, you know, is something else. And it wasn't like this was a draconian law mandate. It was get vaccinated or get tested. I mean, how hard is that? Millions of people are getting tested every day. I mean, this is completely normal. Uh, look, you, you, you mentioned earlier what was really going on here. I mean, yes, they are pandering to their, you know, hard right um, constituency, which is obviously anti-vax and, you know, anti any kind of government mitigation of this pandemic. Uh, they, it's pretty obvious to me, they want to prolong it because, and just pretend it's not happening, but yet have people dying all over the place. So they can blame Joe Biden for failing to stop the pandemic. I mean, this is just part of their circular, you know, strategic logic. Um, but the, the long-term project here is obvious. And for those of us who follow this stuff, and I can't blame anybody for not bothering, it's exactly what you say. They have been for years trying to, um, you know, disassemble what they call the administrative state. And this is, this is a, you know, this isn't a secret. They talk about it. They have seminars and confabs and all kinds of things in which they discuss this in great detail. What's Steve Bannon, we should just say, announced it at CPAC the, the year that the, the that, that Trump won. I was just gonna, I was just going to, to mention him, which proves that this extremist viewpoint is not just in our, you know, in these sort of discrete legal circles. This is something that permeates the entire GOP. And by the way, somebody like Liz Cheney, somebody like Mitt Romney, you know, th this is one they are all on board with. I mean, this is this is one this that there's nobody out there in the in the Republican Party who is objecting to this particular, um, you know, strategy, long term goal that they have had for a long time. And so I think what they're doing with this one. You know, they did manage to eke out a couple of repub conservative votes on the court to uphold the health care mandate, which is stunningly why that I mean, wouldn't anyone assume that would be unanimous because healthcare, care, right? I mean, it's insane that four 
of those conservatives voted against the health care mandate, even in states like South Dakota and Arkansas and others that are putting in place all these bans on mask mandates and things like that. Even they put exemptions for health care workers in there. But four of those guys on that court voted, you know, yesterday or whenever they voted for it, but announced that they were against the health care mandate. So this is that extreme, these extreme views, which are, you know, highly, highly just rank partisanship, really, because this is designed to that particular sort of thing is just designed to, for for electoral purposes. Um, but the long term ideological goal here is to, as Steve Bannon puts it, deconstruct the administrative state. And just a couple of months ago, not even a, a month ago, he was on his podcast announcing that he was he was putting together 4000 shock troops, as he called them, that when Donald Trump is restored to the presidency, they will be prepared on day one to go into every agency and begin the full, you know, spectrum wrecking ball strategy that they have on these agencies. This is a real thing. And when we see what they did yesterday, yes, they're doing it incrementally because they're setting up a series of precedents that they can use to completely obliterate the you know, hundreds of previous pre precedents that said OSHA and other agencies had the right to, to create these mandates. They're setting up a system, which will happen over the course of you know, several years, I assume, where they're incrementally going to be, be creating these precedents where they can rely on that to obliterate a good part of what, what we see as the regulatory state as a positive good that makes America a first world country. We, that we have water that is clean, that we have, you know, we're able to work in a place where, you know, people aren't <laughs> making everybody sick. And, you know, that, that, it, that there is some guidance out there. I mean, I don't think people realize how much that administrative state, as they call it, is, is important to just our day-to-day -day lives. This isn't some abstract political thing and it's not some kind of weird part of our, our government that nobody can understand. This is real tangible, practical stuff that we deal with every day and it makes our lives livable. I mean, it, it's what makes us function really as a modern uh, country. And they want to get rid of this and have wanted to for a very long time. So I, I found yesterday's, that's why I wrote about it today. It was, a, as you say, there was a lot going on yesterday and many, many interesting and shocking and horrifying things to write about. But that to me was the one that just really struck, uh, you know, sent a chill down my spine because I realized really it's happening and I don't see any road out of this short of some you know, radical change in the Democratic Party that I don't see happening. I, I mean, I'm not even sure that at this juncture, radical change in the Democratic Party would really implicate it. I mean, uh, you know, I, 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 I suppose I suppose there's ways. Uh, but um, but yeah, I'm with you of all the, the news stories. And there was uh, a bunch um, this one, both because of what it's going to do for the for the pandemic or possibly could i mean who knows where we'll be in three months uh with this pandemic but what it will do for future pandemics uh is is um is an issue and i i i look at my kids you know my eight-year-old and i realize that by the time he is you know in his 20s there is going to be so, so much, so far fewer protections for people where they work, where they eat. I mean, and, the, it, and, and you're, you know, this is a point I think that people should really, really understand. All those resistance, it doesn't matter who the, you, you want to pick. They're all for this because this, every rollback of a worker protection of a s protection of a citizen or a consumer or however you know like any of us is an extra dollar or 50 cents or a quarter or 10 bucks in uh corporate coffers that's that's ultimately what this is about it is uh you know supposedly some type of ideology about you know no authority this is about corporations making money and uh the training all of us 
to accept the idea that there is no way that we're just at the mercy of like whatever, you know, uh, generates profit for people. That's it. And um, on some level, like, you know, the, this is all like you say, it's all submerged. And on some level, there's like a sort of like a I don't know, like a like a dog that catch the car type of quality, although it's, you know, a, a dog that was you know, sort of like slowly catching that car over the course of like, uh, I don't know, 70, 100 years um, at this point. I mean, OSHA, the OSHA Act, I think is like, what, 50 years old maybe? And uh, EPA is now 50 years old. And, uh, you know, the FDA, I don't know, 80, 90 years old. I mean, the bottom line is that um, people didn't, I don't think our society understands that these functions of government they're ideological they're you know like we take them for granted that like oh i'm gonna go into a restaurant and that that dude is bringing me the uh you know my chicken they they had to wash their hands when they left the uh the 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 bathroom and that's that's an ideological choice that was made by americans you know 50 60 years ago absolutely i mean this is this is the you know what I mean, this is what liberalism, you know, for lack of a better word, and our sort of American definition of liberalism has brought us. And and even back, you know, I mean, the EPA was begun, I believe, under Nixon, right? I mean, oh, yes. this is, yeah, I mean, these were things that there was, there was a certain consensus uh, that politically, this was something that these people could not overtly oppose, right? I mean, the conservatives always opposed it, no doubt about it, and as did big business. And you're certainly right about the fact that this is really a corporate driven, this is where the money in politics has, has permeated this ideology with money and, and also I think with just sheer persuasion. I think a lot of these people now just believe this stuff, whether or not, you know, it, it, they're being paid for it or not. I mean, what does some activist, you know, in some town in, in you know, some, Alabama somewhere, why would they care about this? Why, why are they not getting vaccines? I mean, this stuff is, it, it has, you know, it has permeated their, their belief system. Right. And, and, and it doesn't really have a direct relationship with the money, but it certainly does with politicians. These are the people they, they you know, hang around with. And this is, you know, look at Joe Manchin. He's a perfect example of this. Um, and, you know, he, I mean, I'm sure he would vote to get rid of the EPA uh, because that sort of hurts his per very particular, you know, part of the, the you know, big money ecosystem in, in uh, energy. So, you know, I mean, this is the kind of thing that's been out there for a long time, but they were sort of forced by the fact that there was this, this kind of public consensus. They have chipped away at that. They've worked at it. And, you know, one of the, ten, the, the, the uh, you know, sort of corollaries to this particular goal that they have with the administrative state is also in, in, the, in lawsuits, right? I mean, they used to have, I remember George Bush having rallies <laughs> where he would just say the words tort reform and everybody would cheer like, man, I'm going, do these people have any idea what tort reform? It was like lock her up for George W. Bush was tort reform. And it always kind of, kind of made me chuckle, but still, uh, you know, this was just something that they were pushing and they relentlessly pushed it year after year after year which of course tort reform what they're talking about is inhibiting the right of people to sue you know major companies for failing to have their workers yep. wash their hands or failing to do some of these things that they're required to do under the law and you know making it dangerous for us to live in this country so that goes along with this and i'm sure that we're going to see the supreme court you know pushing hard on that stuff as well i mean this is where you know, I mean, I think I was with you maybe in a day or so after the 2016 election, you know, where we were all with our heads in our hands just going, you know, oh my God. And this was the primary reason. Politics, you know, we're in a period of this polarization where every election is kind of, it's, it's all, you know, they're all incredibly important. But one thing we knew was that the court was on the line. We had old people that were, you know, on their last legs on the court. We had, you know, re Republicans who were ready to retire the minute they got the chance with a Republican president. We knew that stuff was happening. We knew that the, that the majority was going to change. And we knew that this was what was on the table. Yes, abortion rights, of course. 
voting rights, all the usual stuff, the culture war things that you know are very much in play. But this is the hidden agenda. This is the real thing. And this is why everybody backed Donald Trump when, when, you know, when push came to shove, this is why they did it, because this is what they were going to get out of it, was that court, Mitch McConnell knew that they, you know, Donald Trump just was a, you know, an disembodied hand that signed the nomination papers, you know, I mean, he, it didn't matter who it was in there. They just needed a Republican to do that and to get that court and, to, you know, in the lower courts too. I mean, they've got a bunch of cases that are coming up that these lower courts are going to get up to the court that are just, you know, they're, they're scary in the scope of the, of the it, radicalism that is coming up through our judiciary. And, you know, this is the thing that, that had me, you know, tossing and turning in the middle of the night because we knew and this is, and, and this is going to hit people where they live. This is the stuff that hits people where they live. And, you know, the thing is, Sam, I don't, will that persuade people? If it hits them where they live, will they realize that something terrible has happened? Or are we just becoming numb to this stuff now? Well, I, I mean, I, I, two things occur to me. Um, but to answer that, it is when you talk about a radical change in the Democratic Party, it has to be like a, a greater understanding and maybe also, um, you know, in some instances, there's there's, you know, I don't know, Nancy Pelosi getting up there and saying, like, we, we should be allowed to trade whatever stocks we want. I mean, that is, you know, an extension of the same type of uh, a problem. But um, but to have a Democratic Party that can articulate a broader vision of government and society that will remind people that it is an ideological question. Whether we will require not whether you should, but whether not whether a, a waiter should wash their hands after they take a poop a, at a restaurant, but whether we as a society will require that. That is an ideological question. And there is a significant portion of this country, for whatever reason, that believes that we should not as a society require that waiter. Um, or maybe they don't understand that that is a requirement by the government. Or that's or that's what we're talking about. But that needs to be articulated. Um, presented as a sign in the bathroom and a choice as opposed to a rule. Like there's this this muscle memory with a lot of voters in this country that rules slash regulations equals bad outcomes for you. And that's some of it. And 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 I think to a certain extent there is like there's a um, a, a failure to just simply understand that like the. We have had for so long the um, a media that says, like, look, we all agree on the problem. It's just what is the solution? And and that's just simply not true. <laughs> that is just simply not true. We don't all agree on the problem. And um, we don't, uh, you know, uh, agree that the safety of the people eating there is paramount versus the profits that a uh, the entity will make. We don't all agree on that at all. And and so it, it both gets lost in the way in, in the sort of the the, uh, the 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 daily way that uh, the M is talking about, but also gets lost in this sort of like this is an ideological uh, debate as to whether our society should have the ability to get together and to implement these things. And, you know, uh, the, the the Supreme Court's going to fine slice it to make it just like a series of obstacles. Um, they may do the same thing with, with Roe v. Wade. Um, and, you know, and I should also say, when we, just to point, uh, put this in there, when we're talking about tort reform, McConnell tried to do this on a national scale in a different way with the liability shield during the COVID pandemic. And like then the Republicans adopted it on state on the state level. So it's a two pronged approach, obviously, with the courts on one end and the state legislatures on the other. And you don't even have to do it in terms of the statutes, specific statutes like that. You know, um, uh, folks, you know, particularly back when I was doing Ring of Fire, we would talk about this. But when I'm still going to go to Vegas when we start this up again. The courts themselves will change the processes that will bar uh, people from there. So they'll simply say, you know, f forget the the idea of like, you know, specific uh, statutes. They will say you cannot band together anymore as a group of people to right. fight this. California, uh, it was Concepcion, I think was the case with AT&T, where AT&T was charging everybody in the state an extra $3 a month. And... 
That's wrong. It is billions of dollars for them over time, but it's wrong. But no one individual is going to get up and go like, I'm going to take AT&T to court for the $36 a year that they've overcharged me. But if you all band together, all you need is just one lawyer again. You don't need uh, a million lawyers. You just need one lawyer to go in, more or less. And, and the court said, no, we can't do that. We're not going to allow that anymore and that diminishes the power of the people as an entity uh and i will say this too about the agencies and i'm sorry you know i'm, I'm dominating this conversation so much because i'm or, or talking so much because this i'm this is obviously a, a bee in my bonnet for a long time we spoke to sam bagenstos uh who uh, back in 2016 who is now in the uh justice department for the third time um, in uh, the Biden administration. I can't remember exactly where. He ran for uh, Supreme Court in Michigan, I believe, um, back in uh, a couple years ago. But he was in the Clinton uh, DOJ and he was in the Obama DOJ. And he said those eight years, when the Bush administration ran the DOJ, it obliterated the Department of Justice. And um, I've talked to people who are in the uh, EPA, and the four years of of Trump, I mean, people to understand this, imagine if you had a company, a new president comes in and puts people in whose job it is to destroy the company. How long do you need those people to be in there until all the good people leave or all the processes are changed in such a way that there's no institutional memory of how it works it well? Or they get to stay on, because a lot of those people are still there, when the new CEO comes in and tries to change things. And that's what we're dealing with the agencies now. Under a five-year, 10-year, 15, 20, 30-year period of time, when the Supreme Court would begin to dismantle these agencies and their ability to do stuff, people are just going to leave. People who care about the environment, they're going to leave the EPA. People who care about uh, uh, you know, workers' rights, they're going to leave OSHA. They're going to leave the, the Labor Department. They're going to leave these places. Um, and they're just going to be full of people who are just going to destroy the apparatus. And so this is the thing. This type of thing is going to have a, you know, an impact over time in a way that they can overturn Roe v. Wade we can imagine and there's going to be a lot of suffering because of it but we can imagine you know a time where you just someone gets into office and it's reversed it doesn't work like that with this with a government's functioning that has built up over the course of 70 or 100 years or 50 years to protect people as inept as it is in some instances the next 50 years are going to be really real i mean and then you're going to need another 50 years to build it back up. Oh, and it's not like we have any like major crises coming, like climate change or anything, where you might want experts and people who know what they're doing at the helm. So that's good. I mean, there's nothing happening that we need to be too concerned about that could make this an even more extreme crisis than than what we're already facing. And look what they did. I mean, even even places like the State Department. Do you remember? When, 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 you know, who was the first guy? Uh, did Rex Tillerson, the, another rich guy that, that I always thought he looked like he should be on money. Um, that they, you know, they, they put Former him in. on CEO. Exactly. They put him in there and people were just going, what the hell is happening here? And they left in droves. There was another agency to, under Trump. What was it where they, they changed it so that all the, they, it was in Washington and they yes. moved it. Yes. I can't remember it which was, one. Um, uh, it was the um, what the uh, not the Interior Department the uh, what was it? Yeah, they forced everybody to live outside of Washington D.C. Move, move to, yeah. yeah, where yeah. they changed it. Oh, there's no reason for you to be in D.C. And of course, these people are all professionals. They have you know they have families and. Work. <laughs> it was agriculture, Department of Agriculture. Oh, we lost you, uh, Heather. We lost your audio for some reason. Are you there? Heather, we're going to take a quick break oh, and see if you, oh, yeah, here we go. Okay, sorry. I don't know what happened there. Sorry, it's probably me. Um, 
anyway, the you know the the fact that they moved these people out and made them, you know, say, well, what they were trying to do was just dismantle it essentially because they knew that most of these people would not move most of them did not move and so that agency is no longer functional i can't read it was some kind of site they were scientists i believe it was yeah it was it was a part of the agriculture department it wasn't the agriculture department but that's that's the kind of thing that they're doing and and you know we're going to see the results as you say over the next 50 years i mean this is going to be a degradation of everyday life in america that's that's just the way it is yeah um let's move on to you know, <laughs> See, that was fun that was uplifting i mean I, you know we're gonna have sadly more time to talk about this but but it is it is the most submerged the the it is the most submerged of issues and it is also in many ways the most basic and material and crucial of issues and it unfortunately has both those things and so you know 